so now that we've talked about thread pools in general, let's now zoom in and talk about the Java thread pools. And you'll see that there's three general types of thread pools within the ability to make a bunch of other ones based on various factors. The executor framework, which is the focus of this whole series of lectures and lessons over the next few days, supports a couple of, or several different types of thread pools out of the box. So if you just use what you get off the shelf, then there's three or four different variants. One of the easiest variants to get your head around is something called a fixed size thread pool, which as the name implies, will create a fixed number of threads, and then those threads get reused in order to amortize thread creation costs. So we have a pool of threads with, say, four threads, just for sake of argument. And uh, what you typically do, you don't have to do it this way, but it's very common to have the number of threads in the pool be equal to the number of cores on the processor. You don't have to do it that way. You can restrict it, or you can make it bigger. But that's, that's a good starting point. And we'll talk later about some other variants of that. But that's one thing to do. But let's assume whether or not it's the number of cores in the processor or not, we have some number of threads, let's call it S max threads. So we pre-allocate a pool of threads, and then when a request comes in from a client, we make a new runnable to handle that request, and then we execute that request. And what that does is it, it'll take that runnable, and it'll go ahead and enqueue it in the pool, and it'll run it at some point when there's a, a thread available, obviously. If the thread somehow terminates while it's in use, like it hits a null pointer exception or something like that, then the framework, the Java framework is smart enough to go, aha, there were supposed to be four threads, one of them just blew up, so I'm gonna go ahead and make a new one, so we'll keep it at four threads in steady state. It's kind of like the, the Hydra, the famous Greek mythology monster where if you cut off a head, a new one grew back. Actually, I think two more grew back or something, but the point is you get, if something gets killed, you get it back. Maybe a starfish leg would be a better example because it grows back if it gets cut off. Now, what should the size of a fixed size thread pool be? That's, that's the question you have to sort of think about. If you want to use a fixed size thread pool, the obvious question was, what is the size of the pool? So the answer comes down to what kinds of tasks are you planning to run in that pool? Are you planning to run compute-bound tasks, which are just doing computation without blocking on I.O. or synchronizers or so on? Or are you doing something that may involve I.O. or may block? So if you're doing compute-bound tasks, which are basically run to completion tasks, they just burn CPU cycles and do computations, then if you've got an n-core CPU and you want to take full advantage of that CPU, if you want to maximize its utilization, you would create a pool with n threads. So if it's compute bound and you want to really maximize the processing, make the number of threads in the pool the same as the number of cores. And it doesn't really make any sense to have any more threads than the number of cores because they're not going to do anything because as the threads are running, they're using the core, or as, as a thread is running, it's using the core. And so you aren't going to get anything to run any faster by having extra threads, because there's only, you know, sort of, each thread will run to completion with the operations it's doing. Okay, so for compute-bound tasks that are not blocking on synchronization or I.O., pick the number of threads to be roughly the same as the number of cores, or identical to the number of cores. I.O.-bound tasks, however, are more interesting and more complicated. And the reason for that is that they end up waiting. And while they're waiting, if you don't have other threads ready to run, then you're going to be underutilizing the CPU. Because they could be doing something else while the thread, another thread could be doing something on the core while the first thread is blocked waiting for I.O. to show up. So if you're reading or writing, then you want to make sure that while something is reading or writing, the thread that's reading or writing will be blocked, and it'll be suspended, but another thread, if it's available, can, can be run. So what's the number of threads you should have? Well, you have to kind of do a little bit of analysis. You have to say, what's the typical waiting time for an operation, and what's the typical service time? So service time, of course, is how long does it take to do the computation, 
waiting time is how long does a thread wait for I.O. or something else like a synchronizer to be released. And the formula is n, where n is the number of cores, times 1 plus wt over st. And the easy way to get an intuition about this is if waiting time is very low, if you're not waiting very much, then wt over st, if you're not waiting very long relative to the service time, then wt over st is asymptotically approaching zero. So it'll be 1 plus some very low, very small quantity. So n times 1 plus some very small quantity is basically n. So if you're not waiting very long, then you can get by with roughly n threads, you'll be fine. However, if the wait time is very high relative to the service time, then this value would go up. So let's say that you're waiting twice as long for waiting as you are for servicing. So in that case, you know, you'd have, let's say, 2 over 1, then you're going to have a need for more threads. So the longer the wait time is relative to the service time, the more threads you'll need, because while those threads are waiting, you want them to be parked off in a wait queue somewhere, and you want, to allow, you want to allow other threads to run and do their thing. And keep in mind that the goal of this, if, you know, to, to do these computations, the whole purpose of this is to try to keep the cores as utilized as possible. Any questions about that? Now, the obvious issue that this raises is, what's WT, what's ST? How do we figure this out? Well, you're probably going to have to do some experimentation using some type of profiler. Here's a discussion about different Java profilers. And profilers instrument your code, and then you can use them to figure out how long it takes to run some operation. This, of course, is always an approximation. And in real life, it's WT and ST are not often constant factors. They vary depending on what you're trying to do. But at least it gives you a shot at this. So for fixed size thread pools, then this is the way to go if you have I.O. bound jobs. When you have a fixed size thread pool, one of the things you have to be careful for is deadlock if your fixed size thread pool has a bounded queue. And you can read more about what the problem is that leads to this here in this article about thread pool induced deadlocks. In a nutshell, if you've got a bounded queue and your threads do callbacks that, that end up generating new requests that go into the queue, you can be blocked on your callback waiting for something to complete, and you'll end up running out of space in your queue because your queue will fill up, your threads will be blocked, and you'll end up deadlocking on yourself. That's why if you're going to be using fixed size thread pools, it's generally a good idea to use unbounded queues rather than bounded queues, although that has its own headaches, as we'll see later on. So fixed size thread pools have certain benefits, but choosing the right size of the pool and dealing with subtleties like deadlock in some situations can make them more complicated than you might want. Therefore, there are other kinds of thread pools. And one of the other kind of thread pools that you get out of the box with Java and the Java Executor Framework is something called a cached thread pool. And what cached thread pools do is they will create new threads on demand in response to client workload. Now, you might ask the question, how is this actually different from a thread per client request model? We'll talk about that in a second. So here's the basic way this works. So unlike the fixed thread pool, where if you recall, we used new fixed thread pool, which is a factory method defined in the executor's utility class, with cached thread pools, you call the new cached thread pool factory method on the executor's utility class. And what this does is this will create a new thread pool that starts out with zero pre-allocated threads. So you have no threads at all to begin with. And then when a request comes in, what happens is that uh, you'll call the, exec the execute method on the new request. And one of two things will happen. If there are no available threads in the pool, then a new thread will be created to run the request. So it'll, it'll dynamically create new threads. However, once that thread is created, it'll hang around for a certain amount of time, up to a minute, in fact. And if new requests come in, and one of the threads that's been created earlier is still in the cache, because it stays in there for up to a minute, then that thread will be recycled, and it'll be used to run the new request. 
you only end up creating threads if there aren't already enough threads in the pool that are available to process incoming requests. So this basically builds a cache of threads that, that hang around for a little while. If a thread is not used within a certain amount of time, again, it's roughly a minute, then those threads that are unused for that time will be shut down. So this will build a cache, but it'll also make the cache shrink if nothing is used. And the idea there is to try to not pay for, try not to pay for resources that aren't needed. You've probably seen something like this before. If you ever go to a supermarket in the US and um, there's certain times when it's busy, like typically probably, you know, six o'clock at night, people go shopping when they get home for work. And so usually you go to a supermarket, maybe there's gonna be 12 aisles or 12 checkout uh, lanes. And at any given time, there's usually just a handful of people who are working them. Because what's the point of having, you know, 12 people standing there if there's not enough demand? But during busy periods, you'll hear someone say, you know, all, all cashiers come to the, to the front to check people out. And what they're doing when they're not checking people out is they're out there stocking the shelves, they're sweeping the floor, they're in the back bringing in the next day's inventory and so on. But when there's bursty traffic from customers, then they come up and they work the, the cash register. So that's sort of the idea about having a cash but you let them do other things. You, you release them from their service as thread uh, processors. You release the memory when it's not being used for a certain period of time. One of the nice things about cache thread pools is that there's no need to estimate the size of the thread pool. You don't have to know in advance how many threads you're gonna need because they're just spawned dynamically until you finally, until you finally max out. And, and by the way, the max number of threads is the maximum size of an integer on your computer, which is a giant number. It's like two billion or something like that. So if you end up spawning two billion threads, you have bigger problems. Um, and you would probably want to use a different thread pool mechanism if you have that many simultaneous clients, which would be very unlikely. The downside with this approach, however, is during periods of bursty traffic, you can have lots and lots of threads created. So in some sense, during periods of bursty traffic, you can end up with roughly the same problem as a thread per client request model, where all these threads are being created on the fly. So that might not be the best approach if you have bursty traffic and you want to make sure you're careful in, in mediating that in some way. The third type of thread pool you get out of the box with the Java Executive Framework is something called the fork join pool. And this is by far the most interesting of the thread pool models we've talked about. We're actually not gonna spend very much time in this class talking about fork join pools. That's actually a topic for next fall's class. But I'll, I'll give you a little overview here. A fork join pool is a pool of threads. And the main difference between this model and the other models is this model supports what's called work stealing. So what you typically have with the default configuration of this, you have as many threads in the fork join pool roughly as there are cores on your computer. And each thread in the thread pool contains its own queue. It's actually a double-ended queue, so it's called a deck. Double-ended queue just means, or a deck means you can put things on the front and the back and take things off the front and the back. So each thread has work put onto its deck, or it puts work onto its deck. And then when it's done having stuff put on its deck, it starts to process the work that's on its deck. And as long as there's work on a thread's deck in the thread pool, it's happily chugging away doing that work. And it always does it on the, so the front of the deck. But when the deck is empty, when the thread is not playing with a full deck, you know, when the, the thread is empty and there's nothing in it, then the thread will look around randomly, find another thread's deck in the fork join pool and try to steal work from the end of the other thread's deck. So a thread always works at the front of its deck to push and pop items on, but when you're trying to steal from a deck, from someone else's deck, you always steal from the end. And there are various reasons to do that, having to do with trying to minimize lock contention and trying to make sure you do fresh work before stale for work in your own thread 
always get things at the end of someone else's deck, which also means you typically get bigger chunks to work on. We'll talk more about that when we talk about fork join pools and the other class. This is a very, very interesting model. And it's very complicated to program this, which is why we're lucky that somebody else did it for us. We don't have to worry about programming. We just use this mechanism. And so you create a thread whose pool size defaults to all the available cores, and then the threads steal from other threads decks when they don't have anything to do. This model is very powerful. It's trying to strike a balance between a fixed size and a variable size number of threads in the pool. In fact, there's also ways of being able to temporarily grow the pool size when you need to using something called a managed blocker. We won't really talk much about that here. So you can temporarily increase the number of threads in the pool. And uh, it's very powerful, very cool. But like I said, we'll talk about this in other, other contexts. It's also possible to implement your own thread pools. And there's other models of implementing pools. So there's other models like the half sync, half async model. There's models like the leader followers model. And those don't come out of the box in Java. However, there are APIs provided that you can customize in order to implement your own favorite type of thread pool. And later on, when we talk about the thread pool executor class, I'll talk about how you can control other properties of threads and thread pools if you so desire. If, if you want to make your own type of thread pool, there's well-defined ways to do that. OK. So that's basically an overview of thread pools in Java.